In this video, I'd like to discuss some of the natural connections that exist between the concepts in geometric algebra and those of linear algebra. And what we're going to do in this video is first review some concepts dealing with the wedge product. Then we're going to apply the wedge product to systems of linear equations. And we're going to give a very clean derivation of what's called Kramer's rule. Finally, we're going to discuss the connection between the wedge product and the matrix determinant. And we're also going to see that the wedge product is actually a very nice point of departure for discussing other linear algebra concepts. Recall that the wedge product is an operation between two vectors that inputs two vectors and produces a new object called a bivector. Pictorially, we had a very nice geometric interpretation for what's going on with the wedge product. If we have some vector, let's say u, and I have another vector, let's say v, these are the two grade one objects that get inputted into the wedge product. And what gets outputted is a bivector, which is grade two, it has a magnitude and an orientation. The magnitude is given by the amount of area swept out in this parallelogram. And we denote the orientation by either a counterclockwise circulation symbol or a clockwise circulation symbol. If I take u wedge v, the orientation is going to be counterclockwise because I'm going u wedge v. If I take v wedge u, that has the opposite orientation. That would be clockwise. We denote the wedge product by u wedge v. And as I said, if we instead consider v wedge u, these two are opposite. We'll also adopt the convention that if I have some area which has a counterclockwise orientation, that's going to be a positive signed area. And if I instead have a clockwise orientation, that's going to be a negative signed area. So just a convention there. Another thing to point out with this wedge product is that if I take a vector and wedge it with itself, let's say u wedge u, that's zero. So these are the two main facts concerning the wedge product I'd like you to be aware of. So we've been using the standard basis in our discussion of geometric algebra. That is, we had some horizontally directed vector of length one, which we call the E1. And we had another one, which is vertically directed, also of length one. These two vectors are perpendicular. And if we consider E1 wedge E2, this would correspond to the following parallelogram. In the order E1 wedge E2, this would be counterclockwise. This would be E1 wedge E2. And this is the unit bivector. And when we're dealing with in two dimensions, all the bivectors you're going to be talking about are going to be scalar multiples of the unit bivector E1 wedge E2. Let me also give you a quick computational example so that you see the wedge product in action. Let's say I have some vector u, which is going to be written as a linear combination of e1 and e2. So it's some scalar multiple, let's say a times e1, plus another scalar multiple, let's say b times e2. So that's going to be the definition of u. And v is going to be c times e1, c is also a scalar, plus yet another scalar, d times e2. And we're going to wedge u with v. So let me write that out, a times e1 plus b times e2 wedged with c e1 plus d e2. And this wedge product has all the properties you would want it to have. You can distribute. So what happens here is I wedge this term with, with this first term. Since that's e1 wedge e1, that's going to disappear. Now I have a e1 wedged with d e2. So that's going to give me a d times e1 wedge e2. Let's have a look at this term. I'm going to wedge this term with this term. So that's going to be plus BC E2 wedge E1. Finally, I have BE2 wedged with DE2. But notice I have E2 wedged E2 that goes to zero, which means these are the only two terms that survive when I distribute. Now I'm going to combine this term with this term. But in order to do that, I'm going to have to switch the order around here. And that comes with a minus sign from this rule up here. So I'm going to leave this term alone. That's going to come with an AD. Then we have minus BC. So this is the new scalar times the unit by vector E1 wedge E2. So that's what these computations tend to look like when you use the wedge product. One of the main applications of linear algebra is solving systems of linear equations. Even though I should emphasize that it's conceptually incorrect to think of linear algebra as being based on solving linear equations. It's just, just one application. So such a system of linear equations might look something like this. X minus Y is equal to 1. In the second equation, x plus 2y is equal to 0. And the problem is defined 
the solutions, x and y, assuming they exist, that solve both of these equations simultaneously. There are many geometric interpretations for a system of linear equations. Uh, the first one you probably learn about is what Gilbert Strang calls the row picture of this system, which is that you interpret both of these equations as being an equation for a line, and the solution pair x, y represents the location where the lines intersect, assuming they intersect at all. So you can imagine playing around with two such lines. They could be parallel to one another, in which case there are no intersections, so zero solutions to this system. You can imagine where they intersect once, they have different slopes, in which case you have exactly one solution. Or you can imagine the other case, where the lines are the same, in which case there are infinitely many solutions. So this is called by string the row picture because we're reading off these equations one row at a time. We also have what's called the column picture, where we're going to read off column vectors in columns. So we're going to read off the first column, the coefficients in the first column, which is 1, 1. So I have the column vector 1, 1. Both of them are being multiplied by x, so I'm going to yank the x out front. So we have x, the scalar, times the vector 1, 1, added to the second column vector, which is going to be minus 1, 2. Minus 1, 2. And now that's being multiplied by y, so I'm going to yank the y out, is equal to the third column vector, which is 1, 0. Now this xy pair in the column picture has a slightly different interpretation than the row picture. What this is saying is that the xy pair is the linear combination of the first vector, 1, 1, and the second vector, minus 1, 2, that gives me 1, 0. So the xy pair is asking what linear combination of the first column and of the second column gives me the solution column, 1, 0. Visually, this column picture might look something like this. I have this first column vector, 1, 1, which might look something like that. And I have this second column vector, minus 1, 2, which might look something like that. Let me call that v1, the second column vector, v2. And then finally I have the vector 1, 0, which is going to look something like this. Let me call that c. So this is asking what scalar multiple of v1 plus what other scalar multiple of v2 when added together as vectors will give me this vector c. You can get a sense of what the solution pair x, y is going to look like in the following way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the arrowhead of c, and I'm going to draw a line parallel to v2, which is going to land somewhere on the v1 vector. I'm going to take a look there, and that looks approximately, let's say, 0.8 times v1. So that tells me x is going to be approximately 0.8. And secondly, if I draw a line onto v2, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the arrowhead, and I'm going to attempt to draw a line parallel to v1. So that it lands on v2, or in the direction of v2. I can see here it's in the opposite direction, so y is going to be approximately, well, it's going to be a negative number. And judging by the length of this versus v2, that might be approximately, I don't know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. But you can, you can get a sense of what the solution is going to look like just by playing around here. So what this means is that the vector sum from here to here, that vector plus this vector over here, will give me the solution vector c. At the end of the day, in terms of doing computations, the precise interpretation you pick doesn't actually matter. The computations always come out the same. You always get the same xy pair. And what I'd like to do is give you yet another geometric interpretation of the solution pair xy, which is very much related to the comp picture but it's actually going to be a bivector picture. In two dimensions, it's going to be a bivector picture because we're going to find that the xy pair is related to a ratio, actually, of wedge products. Let's suppose we have a system of two linear equations in two unknowns. The first equation is going to be a1 times x plus b1 times y is equal to c1. That's my first equation. a's, b's, and c's are going to be scalars. Then I have a second equation, which is going to be a2 times x plus b2 times y is equal to c2. So the problem is I give you the a's, I give you the b's, and I give you the c's. Your job is to tell me what the xy pair is that solves the system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the column picture. I'm going to read off the columns and rewrite the whole thing as a vector equation. So I'm going to have x times the vector a1, a2 plus y 
times the second column vector, b1, b2, is equal to the last column vector, which is c1, c2. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to collapse these vectors into one symbol, which is going to be a for this first column vector. So I have the scalar x times the vector a plus y times the vector b. That's going to be b. And finally, I have the vector c. So I have this nice compact vector equation, which represents the same thing as this pair of equations. Again, under the column picture, the solution pair x, y is interpreted as the linear combination of a and b that gives you c. Now what we're going to do, and this may actually surprise you how clean this derivation is, is I'm going to solve for x algebraically. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to get rid of this term through the wedge product. Now how do you get rid of something with a wedge product? Well we had that important property that a vector wedge with itself goes to zero. So I'm going to use that piece of information. I'm going to wedge both sides of this equation by the vector b. So I'm going to wedge both sides on the right by b. So what do I get in this first term? I have x times the vector a wedged with the vector b. Then I have plus y times b wedge b is equal to c wedge b. And remember that a vector wedge with itself goes to zero, so that second term disappears. And that gets rid of that unknown y. So what that means is that the scalar x times a by vector a wedge b, this is the wedge product of the first two columns, has to give me c wedge b. So that's the wedge product of the solution column with the second column vector. So what that's saying is just a really fancy way of saying that this by vector here is a scalar multiple of this by vector. And to solve for x, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, I'm going to be bold. I'm going to assume that a wedge b is something other than 0. And I'm actually going to divide both sides by a wedge b. I'm going to actually divide by a by vector. So what that means is that x is the ratio between c wedge b and a wedge b. And that's really it. That's what x is. It's a ratio between the signed area of c wedge b and the signed area of a wedge b. Now, what does this look like geometrically? Let's suppose my column vector a looks something like that. Let's say the column vector b looks something like this. And let's say c looks something like that. So what this is saying is that x is the ratio between these two by vectors. So let me attempt to draw in those by vectors. So in the numerator, I have c wedge b. So let me complete the parallelogram with c wedge b. It's going to look something like that. And notice the order, c wedge b, c wedge b. So that's going to be clockwise in orientation. And then in the denominator, I have a wedge b. So let me wedge a and b together. Let me form that parallelogram. And notice the order is going to be a, b, a wedge b. So the orientation is actually opposite of this one. This one's going to actually be counterclockwise. Now that's important because, remember, we adopted the convention. This is going to be a positive area. This one's going to be a negative area. The ratio of two areas of different signs is going to be a negative number. So that tells me immediately x is going to be a negative number if the, if the vectors look something like this. So what this wedge product business is allowing us to do is to say that x is the ratio of the area, of the signed area in that parallelogram formed by c wedge b to this signed area in this parallelogram a wedge b. And you can also see roughly what the magnitude of x is going to be just by comparing the amount of area swept out. So these to me look roughly equal. And remember, it's opposite in sign. So if the vectors looked like this, I would guess that x is going to be approximately negative 1. So you can kind of eyeball the solution just by looking at the amount of area and the orientation. And the derivation for y is more or less the same. Except here, instead of wedging by b, I'm actually going to get rid of this term by wedging both sides with a. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to wedge both sides on the left this time by a. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to have x times a wedge a plus y times a wedge b. And the reason I wedged on the left is so that I get this a wedge b in that order. And on the right-hand side, I get a wedged with c, so a wedge c. And again, something similar happens. 
a wedge a goes to zero, leaving only this term. I have a wedge b. I'm going to divide both sides by a wedge b. So that implies that y is equal to a wedge c over the same denominator a wedge b. And there's your formula for y. So let's try to draw this thing out just like uh, what we did for x. So let me try to reproduce these three vectors. Let's suppose that's a, let's suppose that's b, and then over here we have c. And then we need to draw an a wedge c. So let me wedge those two vectors, a and c, draw on that parallelogram. Notice the orientation, it's a wedge to the c, so that's going to be counterclockwise orientation. And we also need to draw an a wedge b. So let me draw that in here. And again, notice that a wedge b shows up over here, over here. A wedge b also shows up over here. Again, it has a counterclockwise orientation. Notice this time, these two bivectors have the same orientation, so they're, the ratio of the signed areas is going to be a positive number. So that tells me immediately y is going to be a positive number. And again, judging by the ratio of areas, so it's going to be the ratio of this parallelogram, the bigger one, to the slightly smaller one. So just eyeballing it, I would guess that y is going to be positive, maybe 1.2, something like that. But the important conceptual thing is to notice that the solution pair x, y can be interpreted as a ratio of two bivectors. Let me give you an example just to see how this sort of computation is going to play out. Here are the two formulas that we've just derived. Let's consider that example that I initially proposed, x minus y equals 1, and x plus 2y is equal to 0. So the vector a is going to be the first column vector, which is 1, 1. So the vector a is going to be 1 times e1 plus e2, where e1 and e2 were the standard basis vectors. b is going to be the second column vector, which is minus 1, 2, minus e1 plus 2 times e2. And the solution column vector is 1, 0. So that's just 1 times e1 plus 0 times e2. And now it's just a matter of applying the formulas. So let's calculate x first. So x is going to be c wedge b. So c was e1 wedged with b, which is minus e1 plus 2e2 over a wedge b, which is e1 plus e2 wedged with minus e1 plus 2e2. And let's see what we get. So in the numerator, we have e1 wedged with e1 that goes to 0. Then I have e1 wedged with 2e2, so that's 2 times the unit by vector, e1, e2. And let's see what happens in the denominator. So again, this wedged with this, these first two terms disappear, e1 wedge e1. We have another pair of terms that disappear, e2 wedge e2. The only terms that survive are going to be e1 wedged with e2, so I'm going to get a 2 from that one. Then the other term that survives is e2 wedged with e1, so I get a minus 1 from that, but I'm, I'm going to flip the order to make it e1, e2, so that's actually going to be minus minus 1, or plus 1, e1 wedge e2. And then we get 2 plus 1 in the dom air, so that means that x is 2 thirds. Let's go ahead and compute y, so according to the formula, that's a wedge c over a wedge b, so a, which was e1 plus e2, wedged with e1, divided by a wedge b, which we've already found to be 3 times e1 wedge e2. So what's going on in the numerator? We have e1 wedge e1 that disappears, then we have e2 wedge e1, but I'm going to flip the order to e1 wedge e2, that comes with a minus sign, so minus 1 e1 wedge e2 over 3 e1 wedge e2. And so we see that y has got to be minus one-third. So there's your solution pair, two-thirds minus one-third. And you can see that they indeed work. Two-thirds minus minus one-third is indeed one. Two-thirds plus minus two-thirds is zero. Let's try to make sense of these two results in terms of the wedge product equations. So what I've done here is I've drawn in the three column vectors, a, b, and c. a was one, one. b was one, minus one, two. And then I have c, which is one, zero. And I've just copied that over here. One picture is going to be for x, and the other is going to be for y. So let's draw in some wedge products here. Let's follow this formula. 
So I'm going to wedge C with B. So I'll draw that in. Notice the orientation is going to be counterclockwise. Then I'm going to draw an A wedge B, the denominator there. So that's going to be something like that. The orientation is also counterclockwise. And hopefully you can see that the area with A wedge B is slightly larger than C wedge B. So that explains the slightly less than one result. And then we had for Y, we have A wedge C. So let me wedge those two together. It's going to look something like that. A wedge C. This time I have a clockwise orientation. And again, I have A wedge B, that same denominator. And again, the orientation is counterclockwise. Notice here, two different orientations that explains a negative number. And if you look at the amount of area in A wedge C, you can see that this is smaller than this area over here. So that explains the result that it's less than one. Notice that when we were doing our calculations, we actually had no need for matrices. And that's interesting because this sort of problem is usually solved in a systematic way with matrices. So you may know that if we have a system of two equations like this, you can write this thing as a matrix times a vector gives another vector. And the matrix is just going to be reading off the coefficients. So a1, b1, a2, b2. So that's the coefficient matrix. The vector is going to be xy. The matrix times the vector has to be c1, c2. Now that we're thinking of matrices, if we go back to this wedge product, there's one wedge product that keeps showing up, and that's A wedge B. That shows up in the denominator here, and also over here, the A wedge B quantity. So let's do the calculation. Let's wedge the first column with the second column. So the first column written now is going to be A1, E1, plus A2, E2. That's wedged with B1, E1, plus B2, E2. Remember, E1 and E2 were just our basis vectors. That's A wedge B. And again, when we do the, when we distribute everything, this term wedged with this term disappears. This term wedged with this term disappears. And what we're left with is this term wedged with this term, which is A1, B2, times E1 wedge E2, plus this term wedged with this term, which is plus A2, B1, times E2 wedge E1. To combine these, I'm going to flip the order once again. That's going to come out with a minus sign. So the new scalar is going to be A1, B2, minus B1, A2. Just going to commute there. So that's a new scalar times a unit by vector E1 wedge E2. So that signed area of the by vector a wedge B is A1, B2 minus B1, A2. Now, if we go back up to the matrix, let's have a look. So it's A1 times B2 minus B1, A2. And this quantity appears so much in linear algebra that it gets its own special name. If I call this matrix big A, this scalar, the signed area of the wedging of the two column vectors is called the determinant of A. The determinant is often introduced as this very mysterious number associated with the matrix. But here we've actually got a concrete interpretation for what the determinant is. It's the signed area of the parallelogram formed by wedging the two column vectors. Just that scalar sitting out front of that bivector. Now that we're relating the determinant to the wedge product of the columns, we can attempt to visualize it. For example, if the first column vector looks something like this, let's suppose that's A. And then the second column vector looks something like this. Let's say B is down there. So we wedge A with B. Just draw on that wedge product there. We notice that the orientation, A wedged with B, is clockwise. So that means that the determinant of A is negative. So immediately we can make some inferences about the determinant of the matrix just by attempting to visualize what the column vectors look like. Speaking of the wedge product of columns, I encourage you to think about the case where the, the determinant is zero and what that means for the column vectors. So now that we've related the, this quantity A wedge B 
to the determinant of the matrix formed by A and B as its column vectors, let's write out these wedge product formulas in terms of determinants. So again, that denominator is deter the determinant of the matrix A1, A2 as the first column vector, and then B1, B2 as the second. How about the numerator? Just swapping out the symbols instead of A and B, hopefully you can convince yourself that this is going to be the determinant of the matrix formed with C1, C2 as the first column vector, and B1, B2 as the second, just swapping out the symbols A with C. And likewise, for this formula, this is going to be the determinant of the matrix formed with A1, A2 as the first column. The second column is going to be C1, C2. And then the denominator is going to be the same. Determinant of A1, A2, B1, B2. And of course, these formulas only make some sense when the determinant of this matrix is non-zero, because you can't divide by zero. And when the these formulas are interpreted in this way, as a ratio of two determinants, in linear algebra, this is called a Kramer's rule. And usually it's introduced in this fashion, as a ratio of two determinants of a matrix. Again, notice for x and y, the denominator is the determinant of the original coefficient matrix, which is formed with a and b as the two column vectors. Now notice, importantly, that the numerators are formed by taking that matrix and swapping out one of the columns. For the case of x, the c column vector is going to swap out the first column in the original coefficient matrix. And for y, that c vector is going to swap out the second column. Now that's actually an, an important observation. And uh, notice that we've been working with uh, two unknowns, two equations. And it's quite remarkable that a very similar formula with very similar properties of the solution vector swapping out a particular column holds in any number of dimensions. One last matrix algebra concept I'd like to draw into this discussion of the wedge product is the null space of a matrix. Now, what is the null space? That's a set of all vectors such that when the matrix is multiplied by that vector, it gives the zero vector. Now, if we return to the column picture interpretation, we had the unknowns, the x and y's. So x times the first column vector plus y times the second column vector gives the solution vector. Now, the null space, that's going to be the special case where that c is the zero vector. So our equation now becomes x times a plus y times b goes to zero. Now, if we play the same game, we attempt to find the x's and y's. Let's uh, focus on the x first. So remember that we got rid of that term by wedging out by b. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wedge both sides by b. So I have wedge with b, wedge with b. What I'm left with is x times a wedge b gives me zero, because zero wedge with anything is zero. Now, what does that imply? This equation implies that either x is equal to zero or a wedge b is equal to zero, which also implies that the determinant of the matrix would have to be zero, so that the determinant of big A, that matrix, is zero. Now, if you play the same game for y, if I attempt to solve for y, hopefully you can convince yourself by doing some wedging that I get a very similar equation, that y times a wedge b is going to have to be zero. And again, that implies that either y is zero or that a wedge b is equal to zero. And again, that implies that the determinant of a of the matrix a is going to have to be zero. So what that means is that if you want vectors which are not the zero vector in the null space, what you're going to have to have is a matrix which has a zero determinant. On the other hand, if your matrix A has a determinant that's not equal to zero, what that implies is that X and Y both have to be zero, which means that your null space contains only the zero vector if your matrix has a non-zero determinant. Another way to say that is that the null space is trivial We've only talked about a few linear algebra concepts in this video, such as the determinant and the null space, but hopefully you can explore some others on your own. And hopefully you can see that the wedge product is often quite useful for tying together a lot of these concepts. So I think that'll do it for this video. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe to the channel.
and stay tuned for more videos, especially on geometric algebra. Thanks for watching.